I keep having this vision in my head, like the hangover movie where they're in the back of the car and they're like, we're back. We're so back. And that's how I feel with. <laughs> yeah. We're back, baby. We're back. <laughs> we're back. So we'll let people trickle in, but um, I'm excited. This is cool. We're switching from uh once once a week to once a month i think it's going to be uh, a good cadence for us yeah how are you feeling yeah i'm excited i feel like um yeah it feels good to be here and also just at least we've got the once a month cadence where we can check in talk about stuff i'm really excited about the topic and our guest today which we'll introduce shortly um but yeah i think this will be fun let let me do that right now, actually. Uh, okay. So welcome to Mortgages with Millennials, everybody that is here so far. Today, we're talking about overlooked strategies to win with Millennials. Uh, very pleased to have Melissa Langdale from the Mortgage Collaborative and uh, Joe Soto, a top producer from the Soto team and a first home IQ ambassador. I have a feeling you'll be the, the first of many first home IQ ambassadors in 2024. Uh, Melissa, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. The sun is shining in Austin and that is pretty much all that needs to make me happy. So I love it. And Joe, you're, you're calling in from Cyprus by uh, Carmel Pebble beach. Is that right? No, that's uh, like long beach Anaheim. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Sunny there as well. Sunny there as well. Yeah. We, we, we had cold like in the fifties for, for a while. We, we don't handle that. It's like t-shirts all the time. Yeah. It's coming back, Joe, you know, we're about to get hit with it again. Yeah, I don't, we don't, times. we don't want the cold. <laughs> I can't handle the cold. <laughs> no, I'm actually heading out to Aruba tonight. Oh, so I'll be in the sun. I'll it. be in the sun for a couple of days. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so as, as we alluded the last time we saw y'all, the show would not be possible without sponsorship. And we're very, very appreciative to the Mortgage Collaborative for being this week's Mortgages with Millennials sponsor. As one of the largest mortgage cooperatives in the country, TMC is on a mission to bring together independent mortgage bankers, banks, and credit unions to collaborate to drive operational efficiencies, reduce the cost of origination, and increase profitability. Melissa, there's you know, there's TMCU, which is the education platform. There's a business intelligence platform, TMC Benchmark, trading platform, Cap Trader. There's an emerging technology fund. How do you explain what TMC does and how valuable it is to, to people? What's the elevator pitch? That's a really good question. Um, you know, TMC was really founded uh, to uh, help small to mid-sized mortgage companies across the country be more competitive. Um, and so we we really focus on um, providing, um, you know, technology solutions, um, um, uh, events, uh, those sort of things that, that help our members to be able to connect to one another, help each other to grow their businesses. And of course, we're a cooperative. So as a part of the network, uh, we are able to offer uh, kind of leverage the overall volume of the network to offer some discounts to our, our members that they wouldn't necessarily have in, in the market up outside of that. We were talking before you came on. It sounds like you're getting ready for a, a conference in Louisville coming up here, right? We are. And and uh, yeah, we're going to be in Louisville in March. Uh, we're very excited. Um, we have a bourbon trail, uh, you know, plan. We've got uh, some, you know, derby themed stuff, some uh, Louisville slugger stuff and a fantastic alignment of industry speakers um, and thought leaders. We've got Sandra Thompson um, from FH to Pay coming and um, and a few others that I'll, I'll hold off on on announcing just yet. But uh, really excited about what's what's ahead in Louisville. Should be fun. Mr. Soto, I have a question for you. You are part of the Soto team. Yes. How many people are on the Soto team? Are you the Soto team? It the, yeah, it's just me. Uh, I got everybody else left me. No, it's uh, <laughs> there's I've got three assistants on my team, three loan officers in my branch. So six of us total um, in my office here. So I would love to have Joe kick us off with talking about, because today we're talking about overlooked strategies to win with millennials. And, uh, you know, so we, we can talk about some of the go-to things as well, but, um, but as a first home IQ ambassador, you jumped in, you're very passionate about education. And I thought you'd be a really great person to bring in 
uh, to talk about, you know, what are some of the overlooked strategies and, you know, we can start with one or, um, just wanted to hear your thoughts as kind of an introduction to that topic, Joe. Yeah, for sure. And so I think when you, when you, when you think about overlooked strategies and just home buying in general, right. I, it, there's so much, there's so much anxiety. There's so much bad information that's out there, right? Cause everybody's situation is different. Robbie's different than Melissa, who's different than Kristen. And one of the gifts and the curses uh, with millennials is the information. There's so much information that's out there, right? So if you Google anything, it it can be true, right? Is it a good time to buy a house? Is it a bad time to buy a house? Is the market going to crash? Like whatever it is, right? And so um, my first piece of advice is, is to get good information for your situation, right? Because everybody's so different. Um, and so my good friend, Jeremy Forcier always says, good people deserve great advice, right? Like that is so true. And so the, one of the reasons I really got behind First Home IQ was just because the first um, the first one of my pillars is to educate, right? Like I think people need to know that they can buy. I think there's a lot of people out there who see rates going up, prices going up. They think they can't buy, right? Like it's not for me. I can't do it. Prices are too high. I've been priced out of the market. And, and that's not the truth. I think with the right education and the right plan, you can buy. Now, can you buy the 5,000 square foot house that you're trying to keep up with the Joneses with? Probably not, right? But my first house, I'll be honest, was a tiny little condo behind a cemetery. Like literally the quietest neighbors ever, but I was so grateful to buy it, right? Like it was what I could afford at the time. And I was young, early, you know, early twenties and, and I bought it and I stayed there and I moved up and I moved up and I moved up. And so, um, educating and then having the right perspective where it's better to buy than to rent, just get into something, you know, I think that's, that's so actually, important. Yeah. So good. The move up or helping people understand the strategies that work for them. I think it is something that's overlooked. Like we, you know, I feel like my friends and and in the research that I've done, people are assuming that it needs to, they, they're trying to wait for that, you know, this perfect house or, you know, whatever it is they're wanting instead of thinking, okay, here's how I could do this or house hack or pull in roommates. You know, a lot of people don't even know that these strategies are available to them. Um, and I, I want to share a slide really quick. I'm about to release, this is just, I mean, just finished the 2024 next gen home buy report last night. So you guys are first to see some of this, but, nice. um, I'll be releasing this in a couple of weeks. And I wanted to share this confidence in the housing market. I think this is another barrier that we could talk to around education. Um, mm -hmm. only one or three co are confident in the stability of the market. Um, and only 41% say they were confident home ownership would be accessible to the next generation in the future. So there's just a lot of, um, you know, a lot of fear and skepticism around, you know, is this even available to me as well as um, how would this be available to me? And we can think more broadly like, oh yeah, here's the steps to buying a home. That's not helpful for me as an individual. I need to know what that means for, for my situation. So I think that personalization is so key. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa, what are your thoughts? I completely agree. And the the stats that you just showed were really interesting too. I mean, I, I think there's there's a couple of things driving that, right? There's um inventory is a challenge. So even if you know this this um you know segment can find a home or can qualify for a home, finding a home is is a challenge. And so um there's there's gonna have to be this little bit of opening up of inventory for people to feel a little bit more confident about it. Um, but there also, to your point, is a lot of education we can do around how they how they not only qualify now, but where they can go to to find a home that might be, um, you know, to Joe's point, uh, you know, next to a cemetery, but something that's theirs that they can continue to to gain equity with that they can, um, you know, continue to um, uh, to to just use as a good good starting point for their um, their future. You had mentioned to me when I met with you in New Orleans that unlocking inventory is going to be key and we're coming into spring home buying season here it kind of kicks off in february in uh two days this is a show on overlooked strategies for for millennials what are some ways to get creative with inventory you feel like there's there's inventory that we can make accessible even if 
you know, the vast majority of people are locked into low interest rates and don't necessarily want to sell? Yeah, the, the easy answer is new construction, right? <laughs> uh, if you can't find something, uh, partner with a builder and build it. Um, but there are some creative things that that I have seen out there that you guys have probably heard about, some barn demonium, some um, there's some, you know, sustainable kind of modular homes that are being built right now that um, are fast to market um, and uh, can provide some good, good solutions. Um, but some of those solutions are a little bit harder to finance than others. And so I, I think it's important not just necessarily to, uh, to, to you know, get creative with solutions, but understand it, the more creative that you get, the, the more challenging it is from a financial pers or from a financing perspective as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of times um, barn demoniums, um, the kind of sustainable, you know, new construction that I just talked about that's modular, you're, you're going to have to partner with probably a community bank, somebody that's willing to, to portfolio that um, because they are a little bit outside the box. And, um, you know, for, for those on the call that don't know a lot about why that would be an issue, right? We um, in the mortgage process have to go through uh, the process of comparing uh, the home that you're buying to others in the marketplace. And so when there aren't many others in the marketplace that are similar in nature, it, it becomes very challenging for it to go through traditional um, conventional methods. So, uh, you know, there are lots of ways to get creative with it, but, um, you know, hopefully over time, uh, we'll see some inventory open up to what well, yep. on what rates are doing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Joe, uh, Yeah, I've never been a fan of timing the market. I'm like, if people can get in, get in. But when it comes to these inventory challenges, what are you saying to your borrowers? Obviously, they they want somebody that feels like they're working with them on this is the best solution for you rather than you just trying to sell them on something. Um, so for some of the things like you mentioned, barn demoniums, um, we're doing a lot of ADUs. I'm seeing a lot of people, like you mentioned, house hacking, where you know they're buying a house with the potential of renting out you know, other bedrooms. I mean, I've got one guy who bought a house and he's like, I'm going to convert the garage. I'm a single dude. I'm going to live in the garage and I'm going to rent out the front house, you know, and stay. I mean, so people are getting creative, you know, as far as like helping create inventory. One of the things I've been talking to listing agents about just trying to get homes on the market, right, is bridge loans, is letting people know that they can get a bridge loan to buy that next house. Um, and then I've been talking a lot with people who are selling uh, to use buy downs, right? So depends on the competitive market, but if you're putting a larger down payment, like if you're selling house A and you're putting a large down payment on house B, you could do a two or a three, two, one buy down and get that rate down into the threes or fours. So the jump from three and a quarter to four and a half isn't that big, right? Especially if we all would agree that rates are going to be coming down. Um, so those are two strategies that I've seen for inventory. I mean, I'm really trying to talk to listing agents to help us get more homes on the market, right? Like that's that's so important. So the concern with the seller in most cases is going from that three and a quarter to seven or eight when it was an eight. I hate, we hate to say eight, but if you're saying, hey, if you did this temporary buy down and now you're going from three and a quarter to four and a half, well, okay, well, that is digestible. That's in a normal market. You do that every day. Um, and lots of house hacking, lots of renting bedrooms to friends and, you know, or, or, I mean, I've seen a lot of, a lot of unique things where people are buying homes, you know, and, and with family members too. I mean, it's, you know, everybody, people are getting creative, but there's a lot of people who don't know that they could even do that. Like most people are like, I didn't even think I could, you know, rent out a room or live in the back room or convert the garage. Like ADUs are really big here in Southern California. So like when I say garage conversion, you might be sitting in Florida and going, why would you live in a garage? But here they make them kind of nice. Like if you Google ADUs out there, they're actually pretty nice. You're like, hey, it's not, it looks like the background you got there, you know, Robbie, it's like they're, they're dialed in nowadays. Yeah, it's fancy, <laughs> you know? So that's a huge house hack, right? Like you've got somebody paying three quarters of your mortgage. You're on mute, Kristen. Well, Kristen, you're on mute. 
Why would I do that? Um, okay. So these are the kinds of stories I think we need to be sharing, you know, on social media, whatever, like people need to hear these examples. Cause I do think to your point, Joe, I mean, I heard my friends who were all thinking about buying homes just totally go off. You know, I mean, they, when the interest rates rose so quickly and so much, they were like, oh, this is completely out of reach now. And, and it was, people were truly priced out of the market, you know, and, um, and that wasn't possible for them anymore. But now it's a lot more digestible. And with things like a three, two, one buy down, or, you know, it, a lot of people, it would be possible for them if they used some of the strategies talked about, even house hacking and other things like that, but they don't know that it's possible. Um, I'd love to share a few more of these um, preview slides. Uh, just to talk about some of the the things that I think could lead to some of these overlooked strategies. We know that financial literacy is an issue. Uh, this is just self-reported. So 51% saying that they're um, confident in their knowledge of home buying. Uh, we know from our previous reports on this that the, the financial literacy is really low. Um, so education in general, but in a way that it needs to be tangible. So, I mean, back to those stories, it needs to be like, Here's an example of someone. Um, so while we're talking about kind of the way we're delivering that, um, I wanted to mention, actually, I'm going to go to social platforms. So which social media platforms do you use to gather information about home buying? Um, YouTube was number one. And I want to mention Reddit was pretty high up there. Um, so Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, these were all um, platforms that people said they were, you know, this is where they were going for information. Um, so I'd love to, you know, talk about some of the, the way that we're sharing this as well as what we're sharing. Um, so in terms of the way we're sharing it or where we're sharing it, um, Joe, could you share a little bit on um, what, you know, what you think has been most effective whenever you're sharing content or um, delivering that kind of information? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I share a lot on my social. Um, I share a lot on Instagram, um, which is at the Joe Soto, just my name. Um, but constant education, I do webinars every week. So every Saturday, there's either a home buyer webinar, a credit webinar, or a budgeting webinar um, that I host, you know, online for anybody who wants to join. Um, but it's you, it, it was wild to me how many people would see little old me in Cyprus, right? having tens of thousands of views and people reaching out to me all over the country going, Hey, I didn't know that about X, right. About credit or about down payment or about co-signing. Um, so it, it's crazy. The power of, you know, this little thing right here, you could reach people all over, you know, it's just, you gotta be really consistent and just keep coming from contribution. Right. That's yeah, and I think, I mean, the webinar is a really good idea. And a lot of people get frustrated with, you know, how few might show up, but those are real quality leads. You know, yeah. whenever you get somebody that is, and I, I know my, one of my friends, Jules, who has been on the show before, um, found her realtor through a, um, a webinar that she saw posted on Instagram. And, you know, so these kinds of things are effective. And I think it's important that we look at what's, what's going to generate the most, in, um, you know, quality of leads versus the quantity, you know? So I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. I would have thought that Zillow constituted a social media platform in the housing space. I'm surprised they don't have like more forums and that sort of thing on there, but I, I kind of want to bring this all together, talk about inventory, uh, talk about Zillow, talk about uh, how, how we can get people into homes. Most of my friends will go to Zillow or Redfin or wherever, and then contact a real estate agent. And I'm wondering, Melissa, let's start with you. You feel like there's better ways for potential home buyers to find homes than just browsing around online? Well, I mean, there's a couple things that I always give people advice to look for. One is make sure that you talk to friends and family, um, find the good experiences that they've had and the not so great experiences that they've had. So you can kind of learn, um, you know, reviews are always a, a good place to start too. If it, you know, even some of the sites like Zillow or, um, you know, Redfin or others that are out there, they have reviews for each of their agents. See how, how many reviews they have, how, uh, when was the last review that actually came in? 
Um, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm sure Joe talks about this all the time with his uh, customers as well, but you want to make sure you're working with people that are, um, you know, doing, um, that are, that are buying and selling homes all the time, um, and not just necessarily once a year. And so it's a complicated process. If you're just doing it once a year, it, it might not, you're, you're, um, you know, it might not go quite as smoothly as it would be with somebody that is, is, has their hands in it all the time. And so, uh, those are just a few things that that I can think of. I'm sure Joe has a bunch more. Yeah, I, I would agree, right? I think I think asking friends, family, a warm referral. I I think if you're looking in a specific area, like I had a client who was looking in Cyprus, and they were working with an agent from a different area initially, and they were like, "We don't really feel like she knows this area, right?" And that was really important to them, you know. So if you have a specific search that you want to live in a specific area, then find the area expert, right? Like, and see them, talk to them. Like it's, you know, we can talk to people again, right? Find them at an open house and, and see if there's a connection. I think, you know, too much, if you just click the button, you don't know who you're going to get. You don't know the level of expertise. You don't know the level of, of service that you're going to get. So I would check friends and family, your sphere for sure. And then if you're looking in a specific area, like see who's working that area. Right. They're going to have access to listings when they come up, maybe their office broker caravans. Like maybe you can get something before it hits the market. I so, think that the, the before the market, there are all sorts of pockets of agents across the country who have this network of homes that are like, you know, they want to go on the market, but they don't really want to go on the market. They don't want a whole bunch of people coming through their home. And so there, there is definitely something to be said for that, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Melissa, I want to know thoughts on if there's a tangible benefit to getting a realtor first or engaging a mortgage company first. Do you advise one way or the other? Oh gosh, this is a this is such a trick question. It's like the chicken and the egg. Both are totally needed. <laughs> um, you know, there's there is a benefit to to both. I think it frankly depends on the individual. Um, if if you're an individual that has a strong sense of your financial capabilities and those sort of things and know what you're looking for, it's much easier to step into the space and look for a home first. Uh, if you've not been through the process before, or you um, are, are kind of questioning what you can qualify for, how much you can really afford, absolutely talk to a lender first. Joe, yep. I'll take the bait. Ready? <laughs> you should definitely talk to the lender first, because how can you shop for anything if you don't know what you can qualify for? Right. It's like everybody, I always say everybody wants a million dollar house, but nobody wants a million dollar payment. <laughs> so you have to know the monthly payment. You have to know how much money you need. Like what's the cash to close? How much money is going to come out of your bank account when it's all said and done? Um, you know, you see, you hear the expression, right? Champagne, champagne taste, beer budget. Um, I'm very much of the numbers. So for me, it's a no brainer. Like you have to know your numbers before you do anything. Um, that's not the way the process starts for most people because everybody loves looking on Zillow scrolling through or it's this way, I guess, right? Scrolling through, but the numbers, you know, I meet with people and they dread it, right? They're like, oh, all right, Joe, break the bad news to me. Um, but yeah, I firmly, like, I think you got to know your numbers to me, you know, a house, I don't see homes. Like I don't see the prettiness of a house. I just see the payment and the cash to close. So I took the bait there, Robbie, not the right <laughs> answer like, for the lender to say like whatever. somebody that, that lived next to a cemetery, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not only that, Ravi, but I didn't know I was buying that house next behind the cemetery until we did the final walkthrough. So that's what's even better. I never looked, oh, because it was a little condo. I never looked over the fence. I was just like, Wait, oh, this is cool. Right anyway, did huh? you ever have any like, you know, experiences? No. no, it was a good, it was a good little, it was a good little place. And it's, it's a running joke with my wife where she's like, remember that, you know? So that's funny. That's funny. Um, so we have, I want to invite the audience to ask any questions you have um, and any, uh, also any examples of overlooked strategies with millennials that we can um, chat about here. But I know Melissa has to jump um, at the 30 minute mark. So I want to make sure, um, Robbie, any, any other questions for her uh, before she has to go? I want to touch on negotiation, negotiating, because we, we talked about this when we were in New Orleans and, and I know it's kind of near and dear to you. And I said to you, if I really want something and I get emotionally invested in a home, it's not just numbers. There's, you know, there's a qualitative aspect for me. 
my negotiating skills go out the window. So I, I, I need some tutelage here on what are, what are good ways to negotiate uh, for people that really want a home or really want to get in a home. Yeah. The, um, so one of the, the best pieces of advice my dad ever gave me that I absolutely use to this day is always be willing to walk away. <laughs> uh, so, so to your point, like, uh, even if you're emotionally invested, like don't, um, do everything you can to, to not get to that, that point, even though you may, may, you know, really love what you're, what you're walking into and it's just perfect for your family. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think it's, it's helpful for um, buyers today to come in really prepared. If they are at that point that they're saying, this is just the perfect house. And I really want to be able to um, make an offer that's that's reasonable, that, that fits our family um, and is beneficial for the sellers. Walk in with an actually fully underwritten pre-approval. <laughs> That's like gold, um, you know, go through the process, getting all your documentation up front so that you, when you walk in the house and you can make that offer, you have, you know, the benefit of having actually um, a full approval with you. The other is there's lots of lenders out there that have the opportunity of having a guaranteed on-time closing date um, that might even have a seller benefit to it. So if there are uh, lenders out there that you're working with that offer that, make sure you're walking in hand with that certificate that says, hey, seller, if I don't close on time, you're paid X amount of dollars. Um, and so there's a couple things that you can do like that that just help to get a little bit creative. Um, and uh, but, but the core of it is to try not to get too emotionally attached. But if you do, just make sure you're prepared and, and you come in strong. So Joe, I want your negotiating tips, but since Melissa has to jump, I have one final question for you. Uh, and I would venture to guess that not everybody on this call belongs to an organization like TMC. Quickly, before we let you go, what are the advantages to, to belonging to an organization like TMC? For lenders, it gives them the ability of um, connecting with other uh, C-suite executives across the country. So we um, we have executive roundtables that that help people to be able to grow their businesses, um, and so that is one huge advantage of ours. Um, and oh, for the audience, the acronym TMC um, is the Mortgage Collaborative. Uh, so just just so that you guys are aware, I saw it in the chat. Um, so we we basically uh, curate experiences that that help uh, C-suite executives across the country to, to develop relationships and collaborate on ways that they can improve their businesses together. So um, thank you for the opportunity to to come in and and spend some time with you guys today. I love what you guys are doing and excited about um, uh, seeing where things go this year. And Joe, it was really nice to meet you. But uh, Kristen and Robbie, thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you. you so much for being here. So great to have you. Um, so we've had some good comments from the audience and a couple questions. Um, but before before we get into that, Joe, any additional thoughts or comments on the negotiation question? Um, so so I, it's not very emotional for me. Like I said, I'm a numbers guy. But I think in a competitive market, you have to come in with your best offer right away. Because in some cases, you won't even get a counter. So shorten those contingencies. If you're going to do a cash guarantee, put in the cash guarantee, put in the per diem. Um, you have to understand the mindset of the seller. The seller wants to sell their home for as much money as possible, as easy as possible. That's pretty much it. So I think when you're coming in with your offer, I try to advise a lot of the agents that I work with is you have to come in strong. Some people are like, I don't know. Listen, I want every other offer to come to my terms. That's my attitude. So if I'm doing, if I'm waiving appraisal contingency or if I'm seven days on loan and I'm a 15 day close, well, now that's the bar for everybody else. I know I can execute at that level, right? Because I've done all the legwork up front. I want everybody else to say, oh, dang, this is what we got to do. So that's my, my one thing. Um, and then knowing your numbers, I use mortgage coach a lot. Um, so, you know, everybody knows what their numbers are. I always like to break it down into Soto math is what I call it. So I give people $5,000 increments and go, look, if you increase your offer from 500 to 505, here's what the payment's going to be. 500 to 510, here's like every five grand equals this 30, 40, 50, whatever it is in payment. Um, that way you don't lose the house over five or 10 grand, right? Like that's very frustrating because you're like, I don't want to go up 10 grand. I'm like, well, it was 60 bucks. Like, 
Is it worth losing the house that you've been looking for eight months for 60 bucks? I don't so know. It's not good. my house. Oh, I feel like that is what, you know, if anyone is coming away with anything, if we're, we're talking about that personalization that we started out the, the session with, and, um, and I, I think it can feel like a lot, but whenever you're able to see those numbers and, and really see what it would look like month to month. Um, and I don't find, uh, you know, Allison mentioned that millennials really value every penny. And I, I think it depends. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety around money. And so we can make really bad decisions sometimes because we're just like, uh, I, I mean, I know I, my Kristen math is really bad sometimes where I'll like buy and, you know, the nicest vacuum cleaner on the market, but then be like pinching pennies over some other stupid thing, you know, dinner or something like that. And, um, I think there's like a, you know, there's just a lot of anxiety people are bringing into that conversation. But if you can show people those numbers, I mean, when I was buying my home and I saw the mortgage coach total cost analysis for me, I was like, oh, okay, I can, I can actually look at the numbers and not feel the emotion around this um, because mm -hmm. people are bringing emotion into, of course, making the biggest financial decision of, of their lives. So for sure. Um, so we had a question, John Lawless had a great, um, comment around some of the co-buying, um, arrangements and, um, uh, share. So I don't know much about investment. That looks super interesting and would love to, uh, you know, explore that more, but, um, but of course I know a lot about tenancy in common and that's something I bought into and don't, I don't know if you've seen much of that around, but, um, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of, of new, programs out there. And this is totally separate, but everyone should be looking at all of the first time homebuyer programs. You can go to downpaymentassistance.com to, uh, or down payment resource, sorry, downpaymentresource.com to look for new down payment assistance programs. And it would be great to look into some of these co-buying things and, and see if it's an opportunity in your area. Mm -hmm. Joe, any thoughts on that? No, I don't know. I try to click the link, but I'm not familiar with how the program works, but I'll look into it. You know, I mean, Anything you can do to try to help somebody get in because, you know, just the ROI on owning real estate is just so high, right? Like that's, that's why you want to get in the game as soon as possible. Um, Sean had a question. How do you become the area expert? Any uh, so two ways, Sean, is, is time, right? If you're consistently farming or prospecting, doing garage sales in a neighborhood, um, if you're doing open houses, right? If you're seen, if you do community events, all of that's going to help you become the area expert. I think the one and most important thing, even if you're new in the business, is knowledge, is knowing different communities, different floor plans. So if you do in an open house and somebody comes in and you can go, oh, you live in a Brentwood. Do you live in a three or two? Is that the one with the, gar with the garage attached or detached? Like all of a sudden, you're the bomb, right? Because most people don't know that level of detail. So I think if you're newer, it's that it's learning the information, even if it's not to that level of like garage attachment, but just know the schools, how they're ranked, where the parks are, right? Like that makes you the expert of the area. And then over time, you just, you learn more. And how are you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Robbie. I think Tiger Woods grew up in Cyprus. What kind of house do you grow up in, Joe? He he did. Um, and it was like a regular, it's, it's, it's a regular house. He, he golfed right here, like pretty close to my office growing up. Uh, if you ever read his book, his dad used to golf right here, but yeah, it was a regular three bedroom, two bath attached garage. Like I've driven by it a bunch, but yeah, he did grow up in Cyprus. That's cool. Chris. That's funny. Oh, just Jennifer had a great question. I wanted to continue on that. Like you talk about leading with education. Um, how, how are you communicating that? I mean, how do you, how do you generate business while you know you're good when someone goes through this process, they are educated by you. You have a great customer experience. You're the area expert, but how are you communicating that from the beginning? From the beginning, geez. So we, we do a lot of education. Um, I mean, we, we invite everybody to all of those webinars that we do, right? That's the first. And, and I invite them on social. I invite personally, like when I get the lead, so I'm very intentional about, you know, I'm hosting this to help you, right? Um, I don't charge you anything or any, you know, nothing like that. So um, I think that's that's just it. That's how I, I basically promote it. And then when I meet with clients, like I don't just send over, you know, here's your approval letter. Like it's a 45 minute meeting 
we go over the cost of waiting. We go over wealth building. We go over your return on investment. Like it's a lot because it's a big financial decision. It's not just, you know, here's your sheet and go find a house. Like you have to know everything, right? Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. I found, um, you know, our ambassadors have their custom first home IQ quiz. And so whenever someone takes that quiz and anybody can do this, you can go to first home IQ.com slash get my score, take a first time home, or, you know, a, a quiz about your education on um, buying a home. But whenever they go through those quiz results with them and they're able to start the conversation at the beginning or start the conversation with like, you know, here's what you don't know basically and be able to guide them through that. Cause I think a lot of times buyers don't realize what they don't know. They know yeah. they're overwhelmed, but they, they don't know that you're going to guide them through this process. And so I think framing it with something where you're, helping them understand here's, here's what you don't know. Here's what I'm going to help you through in this process. And, and then, yeah, putting it out Can there. Can I share that link? Is that okay if I share oh, that yeah, link? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll share my link. I have it right here. Awesome. So, yeah. Everybody. Yeah, can so that link is, is there. If you want to take this quiz, see where you're at, like, you know, take action, right. And, and, and learn about it. It's, it's pretty awesome. Lots of, lots of cool questions in there. And we have a challenge for ambassadors to get a hundred quizzes. So help Joe out and start getting, get, getting some yes. points there. <laughs> That's funny. Kristen and I, over the last, uh, year, half year, what since we started the show, we both had talked Joe about how, if we weren't in the industry, the whole financing process would have been overwhelming way over our head you don't know what you don't know you feel like you're kind of being taken for a ride uh, in dealing with your clients what are the moving pieces of financing that you feel like most potential home buyers don't really understand or that that you can really educate people on that that they're appreciative about Ooh, i mean gosh it's all i always tell people it's a foreign language right it's like literally babble you know because we speak in acronyms when you buy but i think I think the biggest thing is cash to close, right? It's how much money am I going to need to close on this deal? Do I need 3%, 5%, 10%? And then so often people don't think about closing costs, right? So I talk about closing costs and prepaids. So I always use cash to close so that you know how much money is needed to, to close on the transaction. Um, and that's that to me is the biggest thing that most people don't get. They're like, oh, I thought I only needed 3.5% down. I didn't realize that there's closing costs on top of that, right? Or can I negotiate and have the seller pay closing costs? You know, um, I think that's a big thing, even different from interest rates going all over the place and values. I think that's a big one because the big fear is like, I don't have enough money to close the deal. I don't have enough money to buy a house. I could afford the payment, but with the price of everything being so high, it's been rough to save. And I don't have 20%, you know, I have five and they don't realize they can buy with five. Well, that, there's um, that's a great segue because another thing that's scary if they only have five is MI. Mm -hmm. it, do you tell borrowers, hey, if you can avoid it, avoid it, or it's not scary, it's overblown, there's a lot of misconceptions. How do you advise people on MI? For the most part, it's scary, overblown, and it's not that expensive, right? Um, but for me, it comes down to just numbers, right? It's the, the thing with buying a house is it's a moving target because values have kept going up. So you're saving, 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 but the number you have to save keeps moving, right? If you really want to not have that MI because values keep going up. So I think when you look at what you would pay an MI 50, 75, 40 bucks a month versus, you know, getting into the house now and waiting, if you look at appreciation versus MI cost, it's very rare that it doesn't make sense to buy before you have the, you know, you'll be able to get rid of that MI and two years or so. That's what people don't know. I mean, if they were able to see what that cost of waiting looks like, uh, that would change everything so for people. True. They, but they don't, they don't know that. And they also, I mean, 70% of our respondents in the financial literacy quiz of that, that quiz that Joe shared, we, you know, are measuring the the results on that. 70% of people think that you need 10 or 20% down. And then, yeah, they don't know what closing costs are. And so they think it's out of reach when actually, if they looked at this, maybe they could buy now, spend a little bit more than they would, would but they would be able to get into the home and start experiencing that appreciation. So that's what we need to be communicating with first-time home buyers and with millennials.
hundred percent. So we have just a few minutes left here. Robbie, any other questions? We have a question about social media where we start seeing impact. We can touch on that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you had any updates or other questions we want to get to before we close it down. I have one final question for you, Joe. Yeah. And you're a top producer. So, I, you know, maybe the bar is higher here, but how do you measure success as an LO, especially in a tough environment like this? Um, oh, that's a good one. So for me, it's just conversations, right? As long as I'm talking to people every day, I know eventually I'm going to win. Um, so it's having good quality conversations every single day. Doesn't matter if the rates go eight, nine, 10. If I have an issue, like that's the only thing I can control. So for me, it's focusing on what I can control versus all of the other junk, which is a lot of it in this business. Um, but, you know, conversations lead to leads, leads lead to credit pulls, credit pulls lead to apps, apps lead to deals. But if you're not having conversations, that's the, you know, you show me your conversations and I'll show you your pipeline. Okay. You know, And then the other part of that is keeping your mind right. It's a mental game. 2023 was a mental game. If you weren't if you weren't mentally strong and ready to show up every day, even when Barry Habib told you it was an alert to lock and rates shot up, you had to still show up. And 2024, people are banking on rates coming down. I'm banking on rates staying the same or going up. Because if I plan for that, if I plan for six and seven, if it's five, it's gravy. But I can't hope for five. I can't change my activity and wait for five or six and a quarter. I got to. You have to run through if you're out there, you have to plan on rates staying exactly where they are for the whole year and just adjust your activity. That's what you can control. You can't control when rates drop. Yes, Barry Habib, the, the one man with a crystal ball in the entire mortgage industry. So I don't know how he does it, but he does yeah. it. he's pretty good. I mean, but nobody predicted last year, right? Like nobody predicted it. It's just, again, that's my thing is like, I couldn't control where they went but I could control what I did every day, right? And and you're having more conversations that lead to nothing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it takes 10 times the activity to get the deals, but it's all good, right? Like, at least I'm not digging ditches. I just got to talk to people. Now, some of them hang up on me sometimes, but I'm normal, you know? Huh. It is what it is, man. Well put. So that's, that's actually a good uh, transition to a very quick market report here from me. Uh, and you, you said it, Joe, you know, a year ago, everybody was predicting a recession, doom and gloom, uh, lower rates, and that didn't really come to fruition. I guess, fortunately, we know now that the economy is healthier than what economists expected a year ago. Uh, and part of that, the, the benefit to us in the mortgage industry, uh, credit condition and credit conditions, excuse me, are loosening. We've seen treasury yields fall recently as it's it's uh, a discussion about when is the Fed going to cut. It's kind of a coin toss for March right now. And we've started to see businesses and individuals take advantage of borrowing, uh, which is great news. You know, If you're an LO out there, talk to your borrowers, tell them credit conditions are loosening. Uh, if you've been on the sideline for a bit, get, get in. Uh, and so this week we will receive the Fed decision. There's expected to be no decision. Uh, payrolls report on Friday. The US economy has been defying all odds with you know how robust uh, employment has been, wages continue to increase. It's, dare I say, Mr. Powell has engineered a soft landing, even if he kind of created the catastrophe on his own doing by pumping trillions of dollars into the economy at the start. Anyways, uh, no Fed rate hike this week. Look for one in March, maybe. Uh, we'll see what payrolls do, see if the economy keeps going strong. Kristen, we're at 1045. Anything you want to add? Just, I loved that comment Joe had around mindset. And I think, you know, a lot of the strategies we talked about today around, um, you know, overlooked strategies to win with millennials, they are conversations and they're, they're topics that you're going to share with people over time, social media, webinars, all of those things are not quick win wins all the time. <laughs> but, um, but whenever you are consistent with this, it is something that's going to have a huge impact on your business, especially when millennial consumers are so skeptical and often really distrusting. So um, just make sure that you are focusing on your mindset and leading with education. And that's, I think, the biggest priority to win with millennials for, for this year. So thank you so much, Joe, for being here, um, for being an ambassador. And thank you, everybody in the chat for being here as well.
And thank you, TMC, uh, for those of you that are interested Z, in not more Z. info. TMC, not as, in, as in collaborative. Did you see that in the chat? I was like, no, that's not them. No. <laughs> that's visit visit uh, mortgagecollaborative.com if you want more info. Joe, really appreciate you. Yep. And Kellen had a couple of quick questions. Um, do you want to hit them real quick? Go, go for it, man. People can log out if they want. Yeah, for sure. Kellen um, asked about consistency and posting. Um, it, in the beginning, it's just do it. So it's whether it's once a week. Um, I, I personally think if you're going to post, post three times a week. Um, and it's either you're posting houses, pictures of other stuff, or yourself talking. But if you can do three times a week, that's going to help you get traction. Um, and if you're a new LO posting videos and webinars, the easiest thing for a new LO to do is go to Broker Caravan and learn how to do property tour videos and say, hey, Kristen, this I love your listing. I'd love to do a quick video and share it on my social. Can I tag you in it? Cool. That's awesome, Mr. Lender. And then do a quick property tour and post that. And then you connect with the realtor. They'll share it. Um, but it's an easy thing for you to do as a new LO. Um, other than just market update, market update, market update. That's all I got. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. All right, See everybody. You in a month. Bye. Right. Bye.